Good morning. We want to welcome you to a wonderful, wonderful day today. Citadel Church is officially open today, Sunday the 13th, and we're excited about this grand reopening today. We want to invite you down the road to please come back and join us on a Sunday morning worship service. There's lots of fellowship and uh, lots of activity here now, so praise the Lord for his grace and goodness over this time and for this uh, whole time of this pandemic. The Lord has been so gracious and so good and so kind to us, and uh, we want to praise his name, and that is the purpose of the church, my friends, to uh, give him the glory and the honor as his representatives on this earth, fulfilling the will of the living God. So praise God we're here and we're available, and we're back. Amen. Praise the Lord. Today will be a day of communion, and so I will be into that shortly. But we also want to just say thank you for your support and for your wonderful uh, gifts of kindness and acts of mercy toward this church and towards God's kingdom. We ask that you continue because we've got a lot of work ahead of us as we go into the fall. There's a lot of people that need to hear the gospel, and so that's what this church and myself intends to do, preach the glorious gospel of the good news of Jesus and to give as many a helping hand as we can. Praise God. Let us pray and uh, we'll start communion. Father in heaven, thank you for this day and we thank you for this wonderful gift, the gift of fellowship and the gift of your grace. And we're thankful, Lord, that we're back. We're thankful as well that the communion of the saints can happen and that we can be in this building once again. We give you praise for that. Thank you for protecting us and guiding us through this whole time. And we give you the praise now in Jesus' name. Amen. What a delight it is to have communion with you today on Sunday the 13th. My communion text will be taken from Luke 22, verses 14 to 20. And so this is a wonderful text in the Gospel of Luke. And when the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Amen. That is our communion text today. Let's give him the praise and the glory as we go into communion. Father, thank you that Jesus is so good and so awesome, and that he is our living shepherd, the shepherd of our souls. We thank you that we have such a shepherd to lead us and guide us even at this time. Thank you, Father, for what Jesus did on the cross for us. And we give you the praise and the glory now in Jesus' name. Amen. Today I'm going to be speaking of the pattern of obedience. And it is a wonderful truth that we learned from, we will learn from Joshua this morning. But also we see that pattern in the life of Jesus, who is our Joshua as well. And so we want to remember him. We want to thank him for the obedience that he had for the Father and for the Father's will that took him right to the cross. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing thing that he was such a suffering servant for us, died in our place, and was the atonement of our sin. So we want to praise him today and thank him in every way possible, for he should be praised and he should be glorified in all ways by his church, the bride, at this time on this earth. On the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this or take this and do this in remembrance of me. Well, I've often said that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread, but he also himself in many of his I am statements, I am the resurrection, I am the life, I am the way, the truth and the life. He would say as well that he is the door and that he is the, the, the vine, but he also said that he is the bread. He is the manna of heaven, and he is the manna or the bread of heaven that we need even today. So take, my friends, and eat, and remember him as the one who was broken and suffered in our place. Praise the Lord. Take and eat.
Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ, for the fact that he is the way and the truth for us. He's not a way, but the way, and he's not a truth, but the truth, and he's not a life, but the life, which we must follow. We thank you, Father, for your goodness and mercy, and we thank you that you're gracious and long-suffering in all things. We praise you today for Jesus, the Son, the High Priest, the intercessor for our very soul, and we give you thanks now in Jesus' name. Amen. Also, on the same evening, he took the cup, and he said, This is my blood which will be shed for you. The blood of Emmanuel's veins would be shed and running down the cross of Calvary for us. The Old Testament says that there is life in the blood, and so we know that the life, the blood of Jesus, covers us and will cover a multitude of sins. We want to praise him today for the fact that he did shed his blood for us. So take and drink. Father, we, we humble ourselves at the foot of the cross today, knowing that such a supreme sacrifice was made for us, the supreme sacrifice of love and of goodness and mercy spread out on Calvary's cross was there for us. Thank you, Father. Thank you that by believing on Jesus, we can have everlasting life. We give you praise now and glory in your holy name. Amen. Today's message is simply called The Pattern of Obedience. I'll be taking this one text, Joshua 1, 7, from, a, from the section of Joshua 1, 6 to 9. This is a wonderful truth about Joshua and his pattern of obedience, and it's something that we can definitely learn today. Deuteronomy 5.32 says, Therefore you shall be careful, or you shall observe, to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand nor to the left. Psalm 119.15 says, I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate or look into your ways. Friends, the ways of God are always good, and they're always the right way for us in every epoch and every time. Joshua chapter 1, 6 to 9 says this, Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all that the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage, do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. In the 1960s, A.W. Tozer said this, If we cooperate with him in loving obedience, God will manifest himself to us. And that manifestation will be the difference between a nominal Christian life and a life radiant with the light of his face. Have you ever thought about the F-16 fighter jet. Well, an F-16 fighter jet is an amazing aircraft with incredible capabilities. But there is one thing that a jet pilot requires above all else, that the aircraft reacts completely to his control. If it were to have a mind of its own, regardless of how remarkable that might sound, it would end up doing as much flying as a doorstop. In the same vein, even if we had all the gifting under the sun, and God as the ultimate pilot of our lives will only do amazing and remarkable things with our lives if we're fully under his control. If we insist upon taking our lives into our own hands at every opportunity, we will soon find ourselves as effective as that doorstop. And less gifted or more humble men or women will be used in our stead. Obedience is the golden key to life and a life of joy and excellence. 
Today's message, as I've already referred to, is simply called the Pattern of Obedience. This is the first of the 12 historical books, the Book of Joshua, and it gained its name from the exploits of Joshua, the apprentice whom Moses prayed for and commissioned as a leader in Israel in Numbers 27. Oh, friends, Joshua means Jehovah saves, or the Lord is salvation, and corresponds to the New Testament name of Jesus. God delivered Israel in Joshua's day when he was personally present as the saving commander who fought on Israel's behalf. Joshua was born in Egyptian slavery, trained under Moses, and by God's wonderful choice, rose to his key position of leading Israel into Canaan. Some distinguishing features of the life of Joshua are these, his exceptional service, his, the Spirit's presence around this man, and the selflessness in holy, heartedly following the Lord as God. When Moses passed the baton of leadership onto Joshua before he died in Deuteronomy 34, Israel was at the end of its 40-year wilderness wandering bout around 1405 BC. Joshua was about 90 years of age. Can you imagine? We don't often think of that. He was 90. When he became Israel's leader, he later died at the age of 110, having led Israel to drive out most of the Canaanites and having divided the land among the 12 tribes. Poised on the plains of Moab, east of the Jordan River, and the land which God had promised in Genesis 12, the Israelites awaited God's direction to conquer the land. They faced peoples on the western side of the Jordan who had become so steeped in iniquity that God would cause the land, so to speak, to spew out these inhabitants in Leviticus 18. He would give Israel the land by conquest, primarily to fulfill his covenant. He had pledged to Abraham and his descendants and to pass judgment on the sinful inhabitants. Look up Genesis 15, 16 for that one. A key feature is God's faithfulness to fulfill his promise of giving the land to Abraham's descendants. By his leading, they inhabited the territories east and west of the Jordan. So the word possess appears 20 times in this wonderful book. Specific allotment of distinct portions of the land were Joshua's tasks, as recorded in chapters 13 to 22. Levites were placed strategically in 48 towns so that God's spiritual services would be available through them and within reach of any Israelite in the land. God wanted his people to possess the land, to keep his promise, to set the stage for, for later developments in his kingdom plan, positioning Israel for events in, in the periods of the kings and the prophets, to punish peoples that were an affront to him because of extreme sinfulness, and to be a testimony to other peoples as God's covenant heart reached out to all the nations. Now around uh, this time as well, through a string of Military victories under Joshua, Israel conquered the land and divided it among the 12 tribes. In these battles, it became evident that God fights for his people when they are strong and courageous and put their full trust in him. At the close of the book, Joshua charges the people to remain faithful to God and to obey his commands, and the people agreed to do so. As for me and my house, said Joshua, we will serve the Lord. God gave his people a threefold encouragement to go forward and possess the land. First, there was the gift of the land. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that I have given to you. Second, the command, arise and go. Have not I commanded you? And third, the promise of his presence. As I was with Moses, so I too will be with you. As the Lord commanded them to observe, to do according to all that, which Moses had commanded, and to meditate in those things day and night. The first half of Joshua is mainly occupied with the keynote of victory, and the second half with the keynote of possession. Though all things are ours in Christ, it remains for us to take possession of them by faith. Surely this is a picture of our present inheritance in Christ, Jesus, who would not spare his own son, but has promised us also to freely give us all things. Christ has promised to give the living water and the Holy Spirit to those who come to him and drink. 
and he promised victory to those who would commit themselves to his leadership. A life full of the Holy Spirit is God's purpose for every Christian, my friend, and is experienced through continually abiding in Christ. He promises not absence of tribulation, but peace in him, not freedom from temptation or conflict, but through him victory, not immunity from toil, but in him rest. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering the rest, let us fear lest any of you have seemed to come short of it. Hebrews 4.1 First, the first point here is the pattern of obedience. Joshua was a highly favored in the matters of God's gracious promises. The promises given to him by God were wonderfully encouraging. He was not to use the promises of God as a soft couch to slouch in laziness. He was to depend upon them as a dependable belt and girdle of truth for future activity. As to our service, let us always regard the gracious promises of our God to us. By the promise, by the covenant, and by the blood which seals it, we are told continually to be at work for Christ since we are saved in order that we may serve him in the power of the Holy Spirit and with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. As Jesus tells us in Matthew 22, 37. Joshua was exhorted to continue in the path of obedience. He was the captain, but there was a greater commander-in-chief who gave him his marching orders. Friends, let me remind us all that obedience is the highest form of courage. Note our text, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do all, observe all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you, Joshua 1, 7. All our exploits are comprehended in that one declaration that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. The highest exploit of the Christian life is to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. This is such an exploit, brethren, that it must be learned in the school of faith to rest upon Christ Jesus and to advance upon the path of obedience in his strength. The world counts obedience to be a foolish thing and speaks of rebellion and anarchy as freedom. We have heard many, probably even late, lately, say, I am my own master, and I will follow my own will. To do this is to live for the world's splendor. It is not, let me repeat, it is not a foolish thing or a rational thing at all for a man or woman to, obedient, to be obedient to him who is the commander-in-chief of the whole universe, the king of kings, and Lord of Lords, as John in Revelation declares in Revelation 19:16, The book of Joshua is filled with spiritual lessons on how a Christian may live the victorious Christian life spoken of in Hebrews 3 and 4. Let me remind us that the source of all strength is God. I love the Alpha story. I don't know if you've heard it. Of the thief who comes to church for confession, he sits outside the confession booth crying until it's his turn. He reads the Ten Commandments and cries. He has broken them all. After he shares the details of his life of crime, the priest prays for him, and he exits the box and begins to pray. He continues to cry and sob uncontrollably. After a few hours, the priest emerges and walks over to the man. He goes over God's love and forgiveness and grace because he believes the man is full of guilt and shame. The thief responds, Father, I'm not crying because of what I have done. I'm crying because of what God has done for me. I now understand God has given me these commands to protect me from the pain of this life. The commands are given in love, like guardrails on the road of life. God loves me because he wants to protect me. And Jesus coming and dying and rising is, is because of my unwillingness to obey. My only regret is I didn't see this earlier. And then he says to the pastor, is there more in the book? <laughs> Joshua, in Joshua's case, his full obedience to the Lord's command involved difficulties. The command to him was that he should conquer the land for the favored tribes of Israel. And to the best of his ability, he did it. But he had to besiege cities which had great walls and to fight with monarchs whose mighty warriors came to battle in well-built chariots armed with all kinds of armaments. The conflicts were brutal and terrible. 
The Bible teaches us that obedience or disobedience is a product of the heart and mind. In, in Romans 6, 17, it says, but yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Jesus himself reminds us, even today, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and strength. And though you and I have no Canaanites to deal with, no cities to pull down, no chariots to encounter, yet it is no easy thing to keep to the high path of Christian faithfulness for Jesus Christ, our Lord. Count the cost. You have just enlisted under my Lord's banner, and you will not find it to be child's play to follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Revelation 14, 4. Joshua not only had difficulties to meet with, but he made a great many enemies through his obedience. As soon as it was known that Jericho had been taken, and that Ai had been carried by assault. Then we read of one confederation of kings, and then of another, their object being to destroy and annihilate Joshua, since these kings knew very well that he would crush them if they didn't crush him. Christ, praise the Lord, is the great peacemaker. Where the light comes, the darkness must flee, and where truth is, the lie must flee as well. For he always is the way, the truth, and the life for us, friends, as it says in John 14, 6. Joshua, in his obedience, needed courage because he had undertaken a task which involved many, many, many years of perseverance and endurance. After he had captured one city, he must go on to attack the next fortress. The days were not long enough for his battles. And there is one instance where the sun actually stands still in Joshua and the moon is stayed. And even when that long day had passed, yet the morning still sees him with a sword in his hand. Joshua, you know, was like one of those old kings, an old knight who slept in his armor. His sword must have been well hacked, and his armor must have been severely dented. He had before him a lifelong enterprise for the Lord his God. Such is the Christian life. As soon as you are washed in Christ's blood and clothed in his righteousness, you must begin to hew your way through a lane of enemies, right up to the eternal throne of glory. You shall never be a loser by God in the long run, friends. That's the great news today. And if you have to suffer for righteousness sake, Jesus said, blessed are you who do suffer. Count yourselves happy that we have a wonderful privilege to honor him today. Someone has said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. So let us faithfully serve and honor him all our life through. Second, the path of obedience. Joshua was especially exhorted to continue in the path of obedience. G J Joshua was not left to his own faulty and frail judgment or whims of fancy, but he was to do according to all that was written in the book of the law. So it is with us, you and I who are believers. We are not under law, we're under grace, yet there is still a gospel rule which we are bound to follow. And the, root and the law in the hand of Christ is a delightful and engaging rule of life to us as believers. We are not to follow in the service of our God our own whims. We are not allowed to frame regulations according to our own conceptions. But our direction is, what's, whatever he says to you, do it. His servant shall serve him. His sheep shall follow his footsteps. His disciples obey the Lord. His true followers fulfill his pleasure. For it says, by their fruits, you shall know them in Matthew chapter 7. For if the Lord delights in a man's way, he makes his steps firm. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left was the clarion call. And it's the clarion call for us today in the 21st century. Take all that is in the Bible, friends, to be true. Never be afraid of any text written by the sacred pen. Always stand to it that your life creed or motto in life must bend to the Bible and not the Bible to your creed. Neither to the right hand nor to the left must the Christian practice be with regard to the reliance of his or her own soul in the matter of eternal salvation. None but Jesus, let me say that again, none but Jesus must be the constant watchword of our soul and spirit. Some will entice us in this direction and some in that. And false prophets will beckon us and tempt us, that's for sure. But let us be propelled and shepherded by the great shepherd of our souls, by Jesus himself, and not trust in the treacherous guides and deceivers of humanity. Keep this truth close to your heart. 
And it's this, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. 1 Corinthians 3, 11. Rest in the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ and put all your reliance upon him as the crucified one, the risen one, and the pleading one for his people. Settle it in your hearts that you are not to be led away from Jesus. Let us ask God to guide us. We can worry, fret, and fume about an issue that God has already dealt with. So we should trust him and obey him each time and every time, not leaning to our own understanding. Being obedient does not mean that we will never face difficult decisions. It means that when we do, we will resolve that he has gone before us and has, and, and because we have committed our lives to him, that we travel, that our travel will be the straight and sure way as the prophet Rhea, Isaiah reassures us, the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give strength to your bones and you will be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Isaiah 58, 11. Satan can trip us up by telling us that God leaves some issues up to us, you know. He whispers, this is not a big deal. It doesn't matter what you decide at this juncture in life was something really huge then God will let you know what you should do we should list many many we can list probably many situations in which we've jumped into a situation without asking God what is what is best friends let me say this nothing is insignificant to God we can say I know whom I believe and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day we must be careful watchful and prayerful as much as if our salvation depended upon a holy vigilance, relying on the precious promises and standing in the wonderful fact that Christ lives for us and not in ourselves. God wants our lives to be filled with good things. He has so many rewards, but for the most part, they are not like the rewards of this world. God's rewards are eternal. Only his blessings bring peace and joy we all long to have. Obedience is a big deal. Let me say that again. Obedience is a big deal and sometimes difficult and sometimes a bitter tasting, tasting pill for us to swallow. It costs us sometimes richly in pride, in preference, and in self-sufficiency. But it is absolutely necessary if we are to maintain our spiritual health because the cost of disobedience is far, far greater. We need to heed God's holy word and not drift away from it. Hebrews 2, 1. Remember what the prophet Samuel said? I'll refrain what he said earlier in the Old Testament. Does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in much in obeying the Lord? Look, to obey is better than sacrifice and to pay attention is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and the defiance is like the wickedness and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. 1 Samuel 15 22 to 23. In conclusion, the practice of obedience is healthy obedience. Living for my master is what counts. Hearing the words at the end of our lives, well done, good and faithful servant, should cheer us on. When the sun is shining and the skies are blue, building our lives on something other than, than the guidelines in God's word can be very tempting. But there's only one way to be ready for the tempests and storms in life. Note the last paragraph of our text, that you may prosper wherever you go. It, you know, this reminds me of the tree planted by the rivers of living water in Psalm, chapter, in Psalm 1, verse 3. The scripture always speaks to us of the long run. It sums up the whole of life. There it promises its true riches. If you would prosper, keep close to the word of God, and you shall have the best prosperity. You will not see it maybe in a week or maybe a month, or maybe in a year, but you will see it, friend. Let me remind us what Ecclesiastes 12 says at the end of that wonderful book. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all, for God will bring into work every judgment, whether every secret thing, whether good or evil. Friends, we all should strive for holiness, a holiness that can be found and attained only through conforming and submitting to the will of Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 8, 29. The Bible is God's car manual for us. If we do not run the car, the car according to the manual, it will go wrong, and so it is with our lives. 
Do our, do our lives mirror him? Or are our actions so loud that we can't hear that still small voice speaking to us? We have plenty of thinking, plenty of talking, plenty of this and plenty of that. But oh, for more holy unction and zeal for the Lord. It is hard to see how many profess to follow Jesus when they keep any rule rather than God's rule and obey anyone or anybody sooner than the Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, let us pray to God that our hearts be sincere in all the Lord's ways, that we may be guided by this precious Holy Spirit even until the end of our life. How would we categorize our life? Are you committed to obeying the Lord? Friends, I've learned this, and this one thing, very important. God's biddings are his enablings. The greatness of your power is the measure of your surrender. Isn't that interesting? For God will never take us where his grace cannot sustain us. It is not a question of who you are or what you are, but whether God has the hand on the rudder of your life. He sends his Holy Spirit to whisper in our ears even today and say, this is the way, walk in it. Isaiah 30, 21. The book of Joshua was written to the descendants of those who conquered the land as a historical account of how they had come to settle there. It celebrates God as general, as defender, and as king. Joshua was able to claim the land. God's promises through the ages were being fulfilled right before the people's very eyes. Not one of the good promises which the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass. Jesus, our Joshua, never dies. It is he who brings us into the good land, and it is only as we abide under his leadership that we shall possess it and overcome all our enemies. Friends, please hear me on this. The bottom line is this, that there is never a time when it's okay to disobey the Lord. There's never a time. We should obey him regardless of what we think or what we feel. When all is said and done, only one person has absolute knowledge and that is the Lord. And he has promised to provide the guidance that we all so desperately need. You can finish well. We can finish well. And friends, the greatest proof of the Bible is Christ himself. Let's trust him today even more fully than what we have done. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your goodness and mercy to us. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your hands of grace upon this little church here in Perfilah. And to all those who are maybe listening in from around the world, I don't know. We ask for your grace to be upon them. We ask that you'd spur them on with those wonderful words. Well done, good and faithful servant. We pray that you would cheer them on, encourage and obedience to Jesus. For this is such a time as this that we need more courageous ones fulfilling your wonderful will in their lives. Lord, we ask that this would happen in Jesus' name. Amen.